Hi everyone, let me introduce myself to those who do not know me. I am Ashnat Kothari, a qualified fellow actually. I am the founder and director of Fanatics. Fanatics is involved in providing classes for actual exams, placement assistance, along with plenty of other services which a student needs at different phases in their journey to become a qualified fellow actually. I have been professionally teaching actual science for the past eight years having mentored students not only from all parts of India but from across the globe. Now coming back to the much awaited announcement, the reason why you are here, we are extending an opportunity for students who have not studied with us to join our classes, get mentored by us for the preparation of actual exams by paying zero tuition fees at outset. Yes, you heard it right, zero tuition fees at outset. This is valid for classes of CM1, CM2, CS1 and CS2 whether you are appearing from IFOA or IAI. Ones who would be joining us for the first time can see how we go about with our classes, the educational content we provide, the doubt clearing facility we provide, the sort of guidance, unbiased guidance we provide and after spending some time, if you find value in the educational content and guidance we provide, you can pay the full fees. Now you might be wondering as to why we are coming up with this opportunity even though Fanatics is at its peak with respect to the performance of its students in actual exams as well as their professional career. The reason is simple. You will not see us extensively marketing over social media be it through Insta Reels, YouTube Shorts or other various ways. You will not see us coming up with new batches on a regular basis or flexing the number of students we have and outrightly ignoring the proportion of students who cleared the exams or who even continue with their journey. Being in the education industry, we make a conscious effort to channelize majority, if not all, of our energy and time towards ensuring that students are having a proper learning journey not just spoon feeding them everything so that they might get certain favorable results in the short term but by ensuring to make them independent, capable of working independently even in our absence and therefore succeeding both in their personal and professional journey in the long run. Do note that we we'll continue to have one single batch for each paper each term to ensure that all our students are getting sufficient time from the faculty do keep in mind that at Fanatics, it is the main faculty, be it Gunjan or me, who are involved in taking the classes, doubt clearing or any sort of guidance or any sort of assistance which the students require in the preparation of their actual exams. As such, we will restrict the number of intakes to 50, 50 for each of the papers. In case you are already studying from us and you are happy with the way we go about with our classes, continue to study from us. For ones who have not studied from us but who are looking forward, this is the best chance for you all to join us, experience how we go about with our classes. If you are a sincere and hardworking student who wants to excel in your actual career, do join Fanatics today for a meaningful, impactful and wonderful learning experience. Hi everyone, in this video we shall be discussing IFOA April 2024 CM2 Paper A. Um, so firstly to give my uh, you know brief description regarding how I found the paper compared to the previous terms. So the paper was more or less in line with uh, the historical attempts. CM2 Paper A from IFOA continues to remain a bit lengthy in nature where students have found it challenging to complete the entire paper. Plus, obviously, you know, uh, a couple of questions in this term's paper uh, seem to be out of syllabus. And I'm going to discuss my views on that as well, as well as, you know, uh, let some of y'all know, if you do not already know, that IFOA has also, you know, released a clarification with respect to certain parts being in the syllabus or not being in the syllabus and how they're going to tackle it. So overall, uh, CM2B was a paper which students did find challenging. They did not... Uh, were in a position to interpret the wordings of the question and they you know a lot of them did mention that they did find it relatively difficult as compared to the previous terms and cm2 paper a also you know uh, one question which we're gonna see 
most of them were not able to you know, attempt. They thought it's out of syllabus. And then even another question, uh, some parts of it, they thought it's not a part of syllabus. So overall, uh, there's a good chance that the pass marks, you know, could be uh, less than what it has been in the previous settings. Not giving any estimate because it honestly depends because there was one full question, uh, which uh, relatively, you know, a good number of marks which most students have struggled to. So the point is that I don't expect the pass marks to be more than let's say 58 or so. And it should be on the, it could be way lower, but yeah, I mean, I don't see it to be going more than 58. Keeping in mind the issues with this paper, the overall difficulty, which a lot of students have found. Uh, another thing is that uh, I haven't really again got a chance to you know, uh, review my answers or uh, just done it at the first go itself. So in case you find any sort of calculation errors or any sort of other, uh, you know, conceptual errors, if you feel there is any, uh, feel free to let us know through the comments section. We'll definitely take a look into it. And in case there is any, you know, rectification, we'll be pushing in through the comments section itself. So for all of you, you know, who are watching this video, make sure that you are taking a look at the comments section as well so that any changes uh, or any rectifications which are there, it would be there only. It, the comment would be pinned. So yeah, definitely take a look into it. Uh, so, you know, before uh, I, I will be starting and obviously, you know, question one, question five were the two questions where a lot of students have highlighted or uh, uh, they were not happy with what was given. They thought it's not a part of syllabus, it's a part of syllabus, so on. So I'll go serially and not directly jump to question five. Uh, let me tackle it one by one to begin with. And uh, also, you know, uh, in case you do find this video useful, I mean, definitely do like it, uh, do drop in a comment as well. And definitely, you know, subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you are updated regarding all the educational content we are updating. And also just to give you a heads up, uh, our new batches are starting from the 5th of May. The orientation lecture is on 5th of May. Again, students can join us right away and start through pre-recorded lectures. The live batches are something for all the papers. It's starting on 5th of May. Getting back to the paper. So the first question, part one, it's a direct kind of book work from EMH. It's part of syllabus. Part two and three is from the topics behavioral finance. Now, a lot of you might be using, let's say, older versions of uh, acted material. As per the latest version, which is the 2024 version, we have 19 chapters only in CM2. Two chapters which were previously there have been removed from the syllabus. These were named uh, chapter three previously, behavioral finance and stochastic dominance and uh, chapter five, which was stochastic model of investment returns. These two are not a part of our syllabus anymore. Part two and three is from behavioral finance. IFO is something which has acknowledged. I'll be sharing the link in the description as well. And this is what IFO have mentioned on their website. Now, again, you all can go through this link later on. Now, the point is key. If you are thinking whether you want to get full five marks for part two and three, I don't think so. That is how it works at IFOA. If there is a question which is out of syllabus, all students will get uh, full marks for it. My understanding, this is my understanding. It, it might not be the way it's done. My understanding is key uh, students who might have attempted this question and if they have done it correctly, they would have got marks. The ones who have left it fine, they would be adjusting the pass marks. So let's say if these five marks were part of syllabus, they would have, you know, let's say hypothetically the pass marks was, let's say 60 to adjust for these five marks, they will reduce the pass marks. Now, again, whether they're going to reduce by five or it's going to be some percent concept is let's say, you know, I mean, there are different ways to look at it for a hundred marks paper. If they're keeping 60 marks as the pass mark. So let's say for five mark, they might just reduce the pass mark by 60% or, you know, you could also say it could be 60% into 70%, which is let's say 42% uh, because there's a 70% weightage to paper A also. So it could be that for a five marks, which is out of syllabus, they might decrease the passing marks by two marks to adjust for that. Again, there are various things we don't know uh, how it's done. And uh, again, the exact pass marks will be known later only. And if we are lucky and if IFA comes out and, you know, uh, explicitly states to incorporate for this five marks, we have decreased the pass marks from the initial level of X to a final level of Y, then at least for future reference, you might know. In my experience, this is the first time where I'm seeing something which is coming out of syllabus. Uh, I, I don't remember the same happening from IFA. In IEI, it does happen a lot. But again, uh, previously, there was no grievance mechanism. You could keep on raising it, but uh, much wasn't done. But things are definitely changing for the better in IEI as well. So this was question one. Question two, 
uh, again over here it's from ruin theory uh, also just to give you all a heads up you, uh, a question on ruin theory came in the cs2 paper as well and some students were like you know this is out of syllabus again it, the ones who are studying cm2 you would know that ruin theory needs the knowledge of risk models reinsurance which is covered in cs2 so again, what was there in CS2, I'm going to discuss that in a separate video itself. Point is key, uh, your batchmates who were sitting for CS2, they also felt a question was out of syllabus. Now over here, part one is nothing but direct book work or uh, differences between the two forms of reinsurance. In part two, three, uh, a couple of, not a couple, rather, I just got, a, I guess, maybe two scripts so far would have taken a look at. Uh, what they did was they expanded e to the power x and what they did was find an let's say an upper limit of r that way. Uh, so using that, uh, I mean that didn't give the exact answer uh, in part 3. So that was one mistake. We could here directly solve it and a similar question is there in a past year as well. In case you have revision notes provided by ACTED, you'll see a similar question where we need to apply total dif differentiation set dr by d alpha equal to 0 and solve for it accordingly. So here's the solution. We start with lambda MXT is equal to lambda plus CR. The amount paid by insurer is 250 uh, alpha because there's an insurance in place and the retained proportion by the insurer is let's say alpha or A. The premium is gonna be 250 into 1.1 into lambda, reinsurer premium, net premium, so on. And simplifying, we get this particular equation. Now in the next step, we are applying total differentiation. So once we're differentiating with respect to alpha and once we're differentiating with respect to R or, or, or in other ways, we are simply differentiating everything with terms of alpha. So when I'm differentiating 250 alpha R, it's going to be, let's say 250 R e to the power 250 alpha R plus 250 alpha. I mean, this term is when we're differentiating R with respect to alpha. And now if you want to maximize R, we're going to set dr by d alpha as zero. Second limit is something which is mentioned in the question. We do not have to check for it. So we equate it as zero and on solving, you get R as ln of 1.12 divided by 250A. And once you substitute this in the particular above value, you get the corresponding value for alpha as well. And this is the value which I'm getting. It's coming out as 0 0.327155. Again, just a heads up in case you find any sort of calculation error, you know, please let us know through the comments section. So this was question two, a relatively, I will say a direct question. Uh, most students got part one and two right, part three, they might have messed up a little bit, but yeah, this was rather a scoring question. Question number three, uh, it has now become a trend, which is maybe good as well. Uh, he almost last five, six papers, if I remember correctly, has been having questions from utility theory and they have been broadly straightforward. So if I take a look, uh, this is part two answer, 1200, 5.703782. Part two, I'm finding out AW. Also, one thing, you know, if you look at it is, I don't know how many of you would have realized key the equation which is there. We usually assume investors to be risk covers. This individual A, in fact, is not risk covers. Because if I'm using a quadratic utility function, you would remember that the coefficient of W square should be negative for the property of uh, basically marginal utility to hold true. That is, if we're assuming investors to be risk covers, we would uh, get the property or, you know, rather the result that the coefficient of W square must be negative, which is not the case over here. And that would be consistent with when we solve as well. So a lot of you might think this is a quadratic utility function, which it is, but it's not for a risk covers one. Rather, it's rather a risk seeking one. And that is why, you know, when we see a question, uh, for a gamble which has an expected payoff of zero, the investor is willing to pay the money to take the gamble. Whereas for risk covers, they would be, you know, they would might not even accept the gamble if they are paid a some amount of money. If the amount of money paid to them is very high, then in that case, they might accept a fair gamble. So expected change, it's zero over here. Part four, let's say this is the wealth post gamble, 400, 300, 100, 0 0.2, 0 0.7, 0 0.1. This is the expectation. It's coming out as 1260 and this is 5.61548. So this is greater than 1200. So definitely the person will take the gamble for individual or investor B. The expected utility is less than the previous one. So he or she will not accept the gamble. Uh, then part, next part. Uh, 
So again, you know, let's say x, this is the payoff of gamble, 100, 0 minus 200 with probability 0 0.2, 0 0.7 and 0 0.1. So the equation is, if the investor is not taking the gamble, he or she has fixed 300 against what is the expected utility if he or she takes the gamble. Now the payoff is x and a is the fixed amount which it's paying. So on solving this, you will see that when you're substituting a as 8.68 or alternatively, you substitute everything, you solve the quadratic equation and you will see that for 8.68, the equation kind of does hold true. Alternatively, you might put 8.68 and show that RHS is nothing but equal to 1200. You might not get exactly 1200. It could be something like 1200.01 or 1199.99, which is again, same as let's say 1200 for this purpose. This was a relatively well attempted question, uh, basis of feedback received by a lot of students. Question number four, again, I will say a very straightforward question, although some of you did mess it up a little bit over here. So this is question four, four percent, five point two percent percent, or you know it's better sometimes you'll get confused between percent and all. Just work in decimals, makes your life easier that way. Part two a. The probability i less than zero point zero five. I saw a script where a student had applied normal approximation. It didn't make sense. You can directly see when will i be less than five percent, uh, or let's say seven percent, whatever is the case. Like what was it? Was it seven percent? It was I was less than 5%. So it's basically talking about 0, 2 and 4%. So 10% plus 20% plus 40% directly you're getting 70%. There is no need to put any approximation direct can be computed. So if I would have been the examiner, I would have definitely given zero in case you have done some approximation because there was no need of same. Again, whether IFA does award marks or not, you will get to know later once the examiner report is out. And in the last part, the mean will remain the same, you know, I mean, you can compute the calculation as well, or you can, what you can do is see everything remains the same. Just that initially the contribution was zero into 10% plus 10 into 5%, which is roughly 50, ignoring the percentage one over here, minus 10 into 10 is minus hundred 30 into five is 150, 150 plus 150 minus 100 is 50. So mean, you will see it remains the same only. So I did maths or you, even if you don't calculate something you will have to observe and again in examination even if they ask you not to calculate you can do it in rough calculate and just see the answer so that you know in which direction to attempt on variance will increase definitely semi variance will also increase shortfall probability remains the same and the expected shortfall will increase because now we are having a severe negative return coming to the question of the paper so question five First thing, yes, this is a typical question which used to come from the chapter stochastic model of investment returns. Yes. Second, is it out of syllabus? I mean, this question was there in that chapter. That chapter has been removed. Okay. In that respect, you might think it's out of syllabus. IFO has mentioned, no, it's not. Uh, they have mentioned it comes under measures of investment risk. Now over here, I will say that there is one definitely issue with the wordings of the question. Just one. Which if somebody would have studied that chapter, some of you know who have attempted CM2 previously uh, would definitely know it. Uh, and they were able to attempt this question as well. But ones who did it, uh, for them, it might be difficult to understand. If let's say one would have assumed correctly, then I will show that basis on knowledge of CS1 and CM1, you would have been able to solve this question. It does not require knowledge of anything else. So it's in between, there's definitely a typo in the question and I'm gonna definitely, you know, email to IFO as well, uh, highlighting this. And if I get any, uh, update from them, whether they acknowledge this or not, I I'll share it with you all through my, a LinkedIn post as well. So over here, an individual has a liability of $1,000 payable in exactly three years time to determine the present value of the liability. They assume an annual return that follows a log normal distribution with parameters mu and sigma square. The ones. Uh, it's an assumption key for studying CM2, you would have prior knowledge of let's say CM1 and CS1. So you all know how to compute present value. You might argue that some of you might have given the paper way back and you do not remember it, but see, that is how the syllabus is. That is how the paper is. You are expected to know. And uh, if they do ask you students definitely don't need to tackle it. And even in other chapters of CM2 time value of money is being used. So that's uh, an excuse, which I will also not accept. Again, what IFO accepts or not is a different thing. But yeah, if I was the examiner, I would have not accepted that excuse. You are expected uh, to know this basic stuff. Although from a very earlier paper, some of you 
might be sitting CM2 after CM1 after a long time or you know ones who started way back they might have studied CT1 long time back they don't remember this but again that that that's not the best uh, way to look at it and it seems like an excuse only so yeah nonetheless over here from here it will look that i follows log normal mu comma sigma square that is the way i have interpreted the question but it does not work that way what it will actually be is 1 plus i follows a log normal distribution with parameters mu and sigma square now again this is something which is not clear from the question question states annual return so annual return you will think of i only i follows log normal mu comma sigma square so this is something i'm going to raise to i for you now coming to it if any one of you got 1 plus i equal to log normal mu comma sigma square right then i will show you how using your concepts of cs1 you can tackle this question it's just using the property of a log normal distribution if x is a log normal distribution y is another log normal distribution and if both of them are independent x into y will also follow log normal distribution with their mu parameters adding up and their sigma parameters getting added up so and if it's minus log x so let's say if x is following a log normal distribution with parameter mu and sigma square then if i'm gonna take let's say uh one by x that is gonna follow a log normal distribution with parameter minus mu and variance parameter remains sigma square only so again, I would rather categorize this as there's a typo in the question and it's a higher order thinking skills question. Students by virtue of the knowledge of CM1 and CS1 can attempt it. So let's say one plus I1 follows log normal mu comma sigma square. Now I'm stating the property if xi follows log normal, x2 follows log normal, x1 into x2 follows log normal distribution. So over here, EPV is nothing but 1000 into 1 plus i to the power minus 1, 1 plus i to the power minus 1, 1 plus i to the power minus 1, or rather you could write it in this form. I am representing y as 1 plus i1 into 1 plus i2 into 1 plus i3. So therefore, y will follow log normal distribution with parameters 3 mu and 3 sigma square. And this is a property again, it can be derived. y to the power minus 1 will follow a log normal distribution with parameter minus 3 mu and variance parameter remains same, which is 3 sigma square. So my EPV expectation of basically I need y to the power minus one uh, for a log normal distribution. We know that the mean is nothing but e to the power mu plus half sigma square. So minus three mu plus three sigma square by two. This is my EPV expression. Second part variance expression also I have it over here. Part two is solving for the parameters. So it's a very good answer you're getting. Sigma square is 0 0.001. There were another terms as well. 0 0.001000 and then there were some non-zero digits but yeah i guess till five or six decimal places or even let's say till three decimal places it was 0.001 i've taken it as it is and on solving mu you'll be getting it 0 0.05 part three you need to compute the probability i have used excel uh, to compute this probability in case you're using actual tables you might get a slightly different one both are completely correct so i'm getting 0.398319 so yes, the issue over here is if I1 is following log normal distribution, then you would not know because 1 plus I will not follow any standard distribution. So definitely that is an error and IFOA or the examiners there need to understand that students, let's say, uh, who have not read this topic, uh, for them, I mean, let's say even if somebody assumes I1 to follow a log normal distribution, uh, I haven't got a chance to spend a lot of time, but, uh, on the face of it, I thought, no, if I1 is following log normal, 1 plus I1 does not follow any standard distribution. So I don't know how this question can be solved. If somebody starts from I1 follows a log normal distribution. And again, if somebody's solving it, I mean, the answer they're getting, I don't know whether those might be sensible answer or not. And then again, it needs to be seen how IFO is tackling it. So yes, I'm going to raise this as I mentioned to you, and I'll keep all updated in case, in case I get any response, but you all should understand that if you were able, any one of you who was able to interpret one plus I one, or if in the question it was mentioned, one plus I one follows log normal. Thereafter, you should have been in a position to solve it. Some of you might say that you have not studied this, uh, that multiplication of two log normal distributions is log normal. I will say that is uh, a lack at your end. It might not be there directly in the material. Maybe you might not have done it in the tuitions you have done but again point is key this is a property of normal log normal which uh, is expected that students do know about it and again it is something you can derive it as well if you know that addition of two independent normal distributions is normal similarly the same can be done for log normal as well
so i would say obviously this is a higher order thinking skill question some students need to apply they need to apply concepts of earlier papers as well but it was something which would have been manageable had this thing been made clear in the examination which wasn't the case so i hope this uh, clears all the air regarding this particular question and now again this question was of how many marks it was of 10 marks. We need to see how IFO adjusts for that. Uh, again, they might reduce the pass marks at one extreme end by zero to account for this question. On the other extreme, they might reduce the pass marks by 10. Obviously, it's going to be between that. I'm just giving a diplomatic range. We don't know what they're going to do. There is no point in you spending any uh, time in, of your life to you know think about what they're going to do. Once the results are out, you'll get to know. So no point thinking about it as of now. Question number six, this was again a question where a students did find a lot of challenge. Now, this is there in uh, the chapter uh, models of asset returns. If I correctly remember the name of chapter, I might change some of the words, maybe uh, asset model returns or models of asset return where you have multi-factor models and all. So over there, there is a particular question, how we can make the factors orthogonal, which has been used over here. So again, this was a very poorly attempted question by many of you. So this was the first part for the covariance and for the second part, uh, you can refer to the material and the steps remains as it is. It's done in a particular example question. And using that, I was getting this particular expression 2 into 1 minus x whole square m star 1 plus m star 2. This was rather one of the very poorly attempted questions. Question 7, runoff triangles, uh, the numerical part, I'll share the file. So finally, the answer, the total ultimates was 7568 and if we subtract the diagonals we'll be getting it as 480 so i can quickly just go through the screen you might tally the numbers over here this is the average incurs to or claim the grossing of factors are there here is the average grossing of factors which is nothing but the average on top whatever we have it's the usual method you can compare the values over here so this was question number seven. Question number eight, uh, part one derived from first principles, the mean of N1. So effectively, my understanding is you just need to derive the mean for a Poisson distribution, which again, you might think it's not there in CM2, but it's there in CS1. So students are expected to know it. And part two, three is again kind of direct book work. Question number nine. Again, this was rather poorly attempted, I would say, by a lot of you. Uh, some of you missed out the fact that the minimum return of 1% per annum is spread for 8 years. So it's not that just 1% and 2.5%. What it's going to be something like 1.01 .01 to the power 8, 1.025 to the power 8. That is my current understanding. So if we take a look, question 9. So we basically buy a put with a strike price of 1.01 .01 to the power 8 and we sell a call with a strike price of 1.025 to the power 8. The portfolio will be, we have one underlying, we have bought a put option, we have sold a call option. Therefore, delta of policy is 1 plus delta P minus delta C. Computations for call and put is given over here. And the delta of policy which I'm getting is coming out as 0 0.27415. Now over here, part 3, how to construct a delta neutral portfolio, direct book work, part 4. It's given that hedging was not possible. The policy is expiring at the end of the day and the current inflation stands at 10% per annum. So now the current inflation is 10% per annum, which is let's say way beyond uh, the 2.5% guaranteed one. So my point is key, the amount of time remaining is very less. So now even if the inflation changes a little bit from 10% to 9.5, 11.5, since there's a capping of 2.5% per annum, now again, you do not know whether... Uh, Again, I mean, let's say whether this particular thing uh, was after the end of eight years or was after the end of the day, we don't know that. He, this was time zero when the company sold the policy. Now this thing, whether it's at the end of the same particular day or it's after eight years, we don't know. Let's say if it's after the end of the same day, which I don't think would be the case because if current inflation is 1% and if it's 10%, it basically means that after uh, basically, you know, what, uh, eight years, the current inflation is 10%. No, now, even if the inflation rate is changing a little bit, since it is the end of the policy day, whatever is the payoff within this policy, I mean, since it's restricted to a capping of lower and an upper capping, so any small changes in inflation rate, given current inflation is way beyond it, 
should not lead to any material change and therefore it's written uh, state with reasons the value you're not expected to calculate as such mathematically i would say so delta should be zero gamma again would be zero because we are assuming that delta is zero so we do not need to do any sort of rebalancing and we go also if there is any change in volatility because the availability of time is so less the value of the policy should not change so it should be zero Again, I would say that I would uh, be spending some more time on this particular part. This is my current understanding. Uh, I would be a bit more sure regarding if uh, my interpretation is correct or not. And ca in case I feel no, it should be something else, I'll definitely put in through the comments section. So do check that as well. And now moving forward to the last question, which is question number 10, which was rather a straightforward one, part one. A straightforward part two, there's a dividend there. So the ones you know who have studied with us at Fanatics, uh, we had covered this question in our class itself exactly. We have covered all the cases, whether dividends are continuously paid or discreetly paid, whether the amount is fixed or it is not fixed. So there were four combinations depending whether discrete uh, dividends were paid continuously or discreetly and whether it was a fixed amount or it was a percentage of the share price. So over here, it was rather straightforward. The formula is K is S naught E to the power RT divided by one plus G to the power four, because in the entire 18 months period, there shall be four dividends, which are payable first after one month. Uh, okay. Wait, this, I guess I might have, uh, T is 20 months. So basically your first dividend is after one month, then seven, then 13, then 19. So you have four dividends in total. And the formula becomes 10 into 1.07. Now note that I've written e to the power RT, but then I later realize in the question it's given annual rate. So I can replace e to the power RT with 1 plus i to the power T as well. So 1.07 to the power 20 by 12 divided by 1.03 to the power 4. So what I'm getting is 9.945441. So I hope uh, you all found this video useful. Thank you everyone.